The harder the questions you're getting in your IELTS speaking part three, the better your exam is going. This may not be what you expected, but there is a perfect reason for this. Let me explain why part three is key to your exam, why hard questions are better than easy questions. We'll look at different question types you may get and learn how to avoid common mistakes and give answers that get a higher score. It's Sassy here. Let's get started. It may seem that in IELTS speaking, parts 1 and 3 are a bit similar, but they're not. And it's very important that you understand these differences. Part 3 is where the examiner asks questions that push you into giving longer extended answers. If we compare them to part 1 of the speaking test, the answers in part 1 will be shorter, just a couple of sentences. In part 3, you can and should give much longer answers. Part 1 is about what you do and what you like. Part 3 is about society and its problems. The questions and therefore the answers in part 3 are more general, more abstract than part 1. The examiner even introduces part 3 by saying, I'd like to ask you some more general questions about this. This refers to part 2 topic we've just been talking about for 2 minutes. And general also means don't talk about yourself. If you do, the examiner will interrupt you and redirect you. Also, the examiner has more freedom of choice. In part 1, they read questions from a script. In part 3, they can choose questions for you. So here is how it works and why tough questions are better. The examiner has three sets of possible questions. Each set covers a different aspect of the general topic. These sets are progressively more and more difficult. For example, in set 1, the questions may be a little easier. They ask you to describe, classify or make comparisons. But in sets 2 and 3, the questions are more complex. You may have to analyze, agree or disagree, discuss causes and effects, make predictions or even hypothesize, or talk about what would happen if something else happened. The examiner chooses questions from two of the three sets. For your typical band 6 candidate, it sets 1 and 2, while well, for a test taker who's likely to get a higher band score, at least a 7, these are sets 2 and 3. And the examiner will ask questions based on the bullet points, but doesn't have to follow the script word by word. So it's very different to part 1, where the examiner cannot go off script. In a way, in part 3, the examiner gets more personally involved in a hope of creating a kind of genuine discussion and is encouraged to ask follow-up questions. Knowing about these different question types in part 3 can definitely help you in your test. So let's have a look at questions from each set. I'm going to show you answers of different levels. Some are band 7, some are band 8 or even 9, and some are a bit weaker, around a 6, and we'll see how to improve them. Here is our part 2 topic. Describe a famous person who's a good role model for younger people. The examiner will start part 3 like this. You've been talking about a famous person who's a good role model for younger people and I'd like to ask you some more general questions about this. First, let's consider becoming famous. Can you tell me what types of people tend to become famous in your country? It's the simplest of all part 3 questions. Identify. A possible opening could be this. In my country, it's mainly the sports stars who are in the news these days. And um, that's mainly because we've been so successful in tennis, football and other sports. And that's not a bad start. And from here, the test taker could go on to a band 7. 
But if we are looking for ways to improve, we could develop this answer like this. When I think about famous people, what comes to my mind are celebrities in the entertainment industry, like actors and musicians who are always in the spotlight. Athletes are a big deal, especially those who excel in popular sports like football and tennis. More recently, social media influencers and content creators have become really popular too. So it seems people from different walks of life can become famous here. Quite a long answer. In your part 3, there will be 6 main questions plus some follow-up questions. And some of your answers can be quite extended. If they are a bit shorter, the examiner will ask you more follow-up questions. One thing that stands out in this sample is idiomatic language. Come to my mind, being a spotlight, a big deal, different walks of life, which means people with different jobs or from different levels of society. Examiners will notice idiomatic language that sounds natural. But don't get obsessed about adding some idioms. Let's turn to the next question in set 1. It's asking you to compare. Is it easier to become famous these days than in the past? Yes, it's definitely easier today. Social media has changed everything. On YouTube and TikTok, anyone can reach a global audience. In the past, you needed access to traditional media like TV and radio, which had much higher barriers to entry. Now, if someone creates some viral posts or videos, they can gain fame almost overnight, something that was nearly impossible before. The answer is directly to the point. You are asked to compare the past and the present, and that's exactly what we have. It's definitely easier today. Much higher barriers. These are comparisons. The answer compares how things are now and how they were in the past. There is a conditional sentence. If someone creates a viral post or video, they can gain fame. It's always good to have one. The third question looks a bit more difficult. It's asking for your opinion. Do you think that nowadays someone can be famous for doing very little? It appears to be like that. It does feel a bit unfair when you compare this to individuals who've worked extremely hard to achieve something significant, or those who've made sacrifices to improve the world. The issue is that some deserving people don't get as much publicity, so we don't notice them as much. Another strong answer. It starts by answering the question directly. It appears to be like that. So, yes. If you disagree with the examiner's question, say so. Don't feel pressured to agree. In our answer, notice how good the verb tenses are, particularly the use of the present perfect. And what about the collocations or set combinations of words we often use together? We make sacrifices or work hard to achieve something. Examiner will spot it all. So these are the easiest questions in part 3. Let's add a notch of difficulty and see if our student can cope with them. Set so two questions. The examiner will tell you they're switching the focus of the questions, maybe like this. Let's go on to talk about the importance and features of role models. How important is it for young people to have good role models? I think it's really important for young people to have someone to look up to in a positive way, because um, there are so many negative influences that can have an impact on the choices we make in life. And um, that's bad. Did you like this answer? The test takers find it a bit harder, I think. The answer is a bit short and it doesn't really say much. 
It begins by repeating the question and ends with the vague, that's bad. A positive aspect is the phrasal verb look up to someone, meaning to admire, to have great respect for someone. The examiner would jump in with the obvious follow-up question. In what ways? Because of the influence some famous people can have. If you admire them and try to copy what they do, but if their habits are not good, it will not be good for you. You can see that, for example, with many Hollywood stars and singers too. That's a bit weak. Here, the repetition of are not good, will not be good, doesn't make for a good band seven. Neither the choice of some other words. Can we find more precise ways to talk about famous people and their habits? Let me show you a band nine level. Because of the influence some celebrities can have, if you admire them and try to emulate negative aspects of their lifestyles, it can lead to harmful behaviors. For example, some stars in the entertainment industry suffer from substance abuse or irresponsible financial habits. It's better to be selective about which traits you emulate. This is a different level, right? The vocabulary is precise. Celebrities, instead of famous people, emulate instead of copy, lifestyle rather than habits, harmful behavior and substance abuse. That's uh, taking alcohol and drugs and traits. This is also a more developed answer. It makes a point and then gives a relevant example. On to the next question, which asks for your suggestions. What qualities should a good role model possess? It must be someone who can be an inspiration to others, a kind of, um, what's the word, mentor. Someone who can provide guidance by showing how to behave and act so you make positive decisions. In other words, a good model would be hardworking, honest and have a healthy lifestyle. This is a good answer. There is no problem at all searching mentally for a word or expression. In this case, the word mental. The last set to question. Can anyone be a good role model? Of course. In fact, it all starts in the family with the parents and older family members who can help shape the way young children and adolescents grow up. I remember when I was young, uh, my parents helped me to, and at school, can teachers be good role models? As well, yes, a good teacher can be a long-lasting source of inspiration for someone. I believe it's important for adults, family members or teachers to really engage in open discussion with children to make sure they follow the right path in life. Why would the examiner interrupt the first answer? Because it took a very personal turn. So the examiner would redirect the test taker by asking a general question. Despite this interruption, the answer was very good. And there are certainly some less common words and expressions to impress the examiner. Finally, set three, the most challenging questions for the most advanced candidates. Let me show you how to deal with them and what to do when you don't know what to say. Let's move on to talk about celebrities and celebrity culture. Why is it that some people have a kind of unhealthy obsession with celebrities? I suppose it's just what we are surrounded by these days. It's hard to get away from social media or avoid being bombarded with stories about the rich and famous. Maybe, on the one hand, it's a way of escaping from the routine of our everyday lives when we read or see stories about celebrity lifestyles that seem so glamorous. But um, on the other hand, some people get too involved in it and become really fanatic. 
a great answer that has all the features of a Band 8 at least. We know in part 3 it's important to give extended answers, and it's your chance to show how you can put your thoughts together. Look at the second part of the example. On the one hand, on the other hand, this is a nice way to organize your ideas. Next. So, is the influence of celebrity culture positive or negative? Yes, well, as I was saying, I feel that it has more drawbacks than anything else. And it all seems far too superficial. This focus on where they live and what they eat and what they do, especially since it's their bad behavior that gets the most publicity. But still, it's the media that's to blame with all those shows and articles that go on and on about the rich and famous. Notice how well the test taker gives examples of this focus on the superficial. Giving examples is a good way to extend your answers. The examiner would also notice a very interesting piece of grammar. It's the media that's to blame. This is called a cleft sentence. It emphasizes a particular part of the sentence, often starting with it is, it was. Instead of just saying the media is to blame, we say it's the media that's to blame, putting the emphasis on the media. Now, a question to really push the test taker. Could it be said that celebrity culture will one day be seen as a defining characteristic of the 21st century? There is often a question that has us struggling for an answer. It's a good idea to have some useful phrases to keep the talk flowing while you're thinking about what to say next. Some people call these fillers. To be honest, to tell you the truth, in my opinion, if you ask me, and we can comment on our state of knowledge on the subject or lack thereof. This is not something I know a lot about, but I've never given this very much thought, but so we can start like this. Well, to tell the truth, this is something I've never given very much thought to, but I guess it's true. Well, maybe not so much where I come from, but certainly in some cultures, like the United States or in Western Europe, where even political leaders are often seen as celebrities. And in sport, it's the same. It's an answer. There is nothing worse than silence. And remember, there are no right or wrong answers in IELTS speaking. The examiner is only interested in your use of English, not if your answer is factually correct or very profound. Part 3 in IELTS speaking is where the examiner push you to the limit to check how advanced your skills really are. And even though it only lasts for five minutes, I promise you, you'll be delighted to hear the magic words, thank you, this is the end of your speaking test. And the best way to start your part three with confidence is to finish your two minute part two talk really well. And in this video, you can learn how to give great part two answers, even if the topic seems unlucky and you don't know what to say. Thank you so much for watching me today. Good luck with your preparation and your exam. Bye.